something that keeps us from evangelizing, maybe some insecurity or maybe just feeling as we don't know enough. And so let's go over some of those barriers and, and speak about that. But then we're going to finish up and look at Jesus, the master evangelist. We know that he is the master teacher. There has never uh, been a teacher on earth that is better than our Lord. But there's also never been an evangelist better than our Lord. And so we'll look at him in John chapter 4, at the woman at the well, and kind of take piece by piece what he did, and then we can emulate that as well as we present the gospel. And so the reason why we are speaking about it this morning is that we have a commission. Before Christ was ascended up to the Father, he left us with a command. And Jesus came and spake unto them, saying, All power is given unto me in heaven and in earth. Go ye therefore and teach all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Ghost, teaching them to observe all things whatsoever I have commanded you. And lo, I am with you always, even unto the end of the world. And so we have this command. And this, this word, this phrase, go ye, as you may have heard, means go me. Every individual in this auditorium this morning must go and evangelize. It's not specified to only the, the preacher or you know, the associate minister or those Bible class teachers, but every individual has this placed upon them. Now, a reason why this is very important, and I, I don't believe that you can see that very well, but this is a chart from the early 1900s going over the number of members of the church in the United States. And in the 60s and 70s, we had the, the highest amount of Christians per capita. And so it was that one in every 84 people in America in the 60s and 70s was a member of the Lord's church. And that has declined over the years. And I don't bring this up here to uh, kind of be doom and gloom and pessimistic about the Lord's churches is losing numbers. I bring this up here to show that there is a trend and there is a downward trend and we must take responsibility to ensure that this trend reverses and that the numbers increase and that there are more in the Lord's church to know the gospel, to be saved. And this is something that we must individually feel the importance of. Now, any problem that we could look at is a, a complex problem. There's not necessarily just one individual issue. However, there may be some parts of the problem that have a, a bigger portion that can be explained by something. And so in, in regards to these numbers, many have believed that the reason why it's decreasing is a lack of personal Bible study, lack of one-on-one -on -one sitting down with an individual, opening up the Bible, and teaching them the gospel. Now this was something that was very common a number of years ago, and particularly in the 60s and 70s. But now some believe that maybe it's because we rely on gospel meetings and we rely on, on sermons to try and convert someone to Christ. Now that is a, a very great tool, of course, but we cannot rely on that solely. And I've heard this illustration and I, th I think it helps us to visualize this. If you have an individual that you are trying to teach the gospel to, you can imagine them as an empty water bottle. And so the preacher, as he is proclaiming the sermon, he is proclaiming it to an audience of a, a wide number of people with different backgrounds, different knowledges. And so you can imagine him taking a bucket of water and putting it up in the air. Now, how much of that water that he has put up in the air is going to go into those empty bottles of water? Not very much, maybe just a little bit. But if you take an individual and you sit down with them at a table, one-on-one, -on -one, you open the scriptures with them and you teach them the gospel, it is as if you take that, that empty bottle of water and you're putting it to a spigot, and you can fill it all the way to the top. You can teach them the gospel and everything that they might need to know. And so that is why personal evangelism and sitting down with an open Bible is so very important. Now, I want you to consider what are some barriers in your life? Now, I know that in an audience this size, there are probably a number who have evangelized their entire life, and they have a lot of experience in this area. And this is an area that I know that I want to grow in and I want to learn. But I ask you, maybe you can, you can ask yourself, well, what are some barriers I've heard other people say? Or you can ask in your own life. If someone told you to go and have a Bible study with someone, what is the first thing that will come to your mind? Would it be, well, maybe I don't know enough? Well, I'm, I'm worried I might mess this opportunity up. What, what is the barrier? What is the thing that comes to mind? And I want you to keep that in your mind because we're going to go over some common barriers. And I, I'll bet you that one of those barriers that comes to mind is going to be in this list. And so let's address some of these things in the list. So the first barrier is the fear of rejection. Now rejection is not <laughs> uncommon to God's people, is it? Turn over to the book of Ezekiel. 
Ezekiel chapter 3, God tells Ezekiel in verse 7, as he's giving him a commission to go and teach his word to the Israelites, he tells Ezekiel, they're not going to listen to you. And can you imagine being told that the people that you're going to be preaching to you are not going to change, they're not going to respond, but this is what the Lord said in verse 7, but unto the house of Israel will not hearken unto thee, for they will not hearken unto me, for all the house of Israel are impudent and hard-hearted, they're very stubborn. And so, let's also consider what that would look like if we're knocking on someone's door, and someone says, no, I am not interested, and they slam the door in your face. Now, initially, you know, for the first couple of minutes, that might bother you. Maybe even to the end of the day, that might bother you. But over time, you're going to forget that rejection. It is going to fade. So is rejection really uh, something that should prevent us from evangelizing? It should not be. Next one is maybe we have a harm of doing uh, more harm than good. For some reason, the slide is not progressing. So the next one is a fear of doing more harm than good. Now, consider the state of the world at the moment. Consider all of the violence that's going on in the Ukraine. People are, are cynical, people are discouraged, and yet if someone has a member of the Lord's Church come and knock on their door and offer them prayers, offer them help, even maybe offer them a Bible study or assistance in some way, do you think that that would make them more cynical or do you think that would help them? The mere fact that you are trying to help another individual can only help the community, can only help that individual, regardless of how they respond to the gospel. And so this fear of, of doing more harm than good should not prevent us from evangelizing. The next is a, a fear of failure. And this is something we need to keep in our minds, is what is failure when it comes to personal evangelism? It is not that I presented the gospel and they rejected it, or I feel that I was inadequate in some way, that I didn't do it right. Failure is not going at all. Failure is not going and evangelizing or attempting at all. Ezekiel was told by God in verse 19 of that same chapter we looked at, that if you warn the wicked, and he turns not from his wickedness, he turns not from his wicked way, well, his soul shall die in his iniquity, but you have delivered your soul. So, failure for the Christian is not going at all. But, we must remember that just presenting the gospel is success for the Christian. Being afraid of not knowing enough. I bet that every single Christian who goes out and evangelizes probably has this insecurity. I do not know enough. I hope that we are never in a position in our Christianity where we think that we know everything, but that we are always progressing, always striving, because the, the Bible has so much for us to learn. But we are never going to go into a situation and know that I can handle absolutely everything but rather we should attempt and go out and try, and go and learn. Next one is, oh, I'm afraid that I do not know how to present the gospel. Well, where do I start? What do I do? And this is where there is a number of good resources in the Brotherhood. Brother Rob Whitaker has, uh, has been teaching the Brotherhood how to use Back to the Bible, and a number of other good resources are available to us. We have a plethora, so many different resources that we can use to help guide a Bible study. We do not have to know how to go to the book of Acts and ex exegete every single verse and every single chapter. That could be very daunting. But you and I can open up a booklet and go to those verses and explain them and help another person come to the knowledge of the Bible. There are a number of resources that we can use. We don't have to worry about maybe I do not know enough. Now the next one is maybe they believe that this is not their God-given talent. Well, I'm just not a good evangelist. I cannot speak well. Well, first off, I would ask you, do you know that? Even Moses in the book of Exodus, he told God, you know, I, I, I'm, not, I'm slow of speech, I cannot do this. But then eventually it was Moses who was the leader. He was the spokesperson. And God knew that he would get to that point. But if we never try and we never put ourselves out there, how do we know that's not our talent? We may have a talent for this that we do not know. But regardless of whether or not we feel talented in this area, God said, go. And every one of us must go, regardless of whether we view it as our talent or not. And again, every individual in this auditorium has a different background, a different story, different personality. You may be able to reach someone that I never could. You may be able to speak to someone in a way that they will be receptive to the gospel. But me as a young student, they may not listen to me, but they may listen to you. 
And so even if you feel that you are not a good speaker, what you bring to the, that situation, what you bring to that door knocking, that individual, can be the difference between whether that person is receptive to the gospel or rejects it. And so never discount what you can bring. And then the last one, maybe people do not feel an obligation. Well, why do I have to do that? And for that, I wonder if sometimes the church suffers from something that we would call the bystander effect. Now, the bystander effect is something that has been proven time and time again in research in the area of social psychology. If there's a person that is in need, if there's a person who is, is uh, injured or is on the side of the road and they need help, and there's only one person walking by, they are more likely to offer that person assistance. But as the number of individuals increase around that person who needs aid, that person may not help. The likelihood of that individual helping goes down because they think, well, someone else can help. Someone else who is more capable will help. And in a congregation that is large, I wonder if maybe we think, well, there's, some, there's someone else who is better fitted for that task. Someone else will go. Well, the preacher will go. That's why we pay him. That's why he's here. But what about my individual's responsibility? There are people in my community, there's people around my social sphere that the preacher may never come in contact with, but you and I come in contact with them. Are we going to present the gospel to them? That is our opportunity, and so we must consider that. So these are the, the most common hesitancies to personally evangelize the gospel. Now, I also want to bring this up, is a, the idea of a, a prayer card. And so I have a couple of these that I brought with me, about 50. So if you would like this, after I explain it, if you would like one, please come up to me. I would love to, to give you one. All this has is 10 slots, and it's designed for you to put the names of 10 different individuals on here, or families. You can put this in your Bible as a place marker, and then when you open up your Bible for your personal Bible study and you see the names of those who you would like to share the gospel with, or those you know who are lost and need help, you can pray for those individuals. Pray for opportunities for yourself, pray for opportunities for other people. And on the back of this card, there's a number of different suggestions for what you can do to help bring that person to the knowledge of the gospel. Not only cooking a meal, but also praying for them, making sure that we are familiar with a, a, a method of Bible study. And so this can be a really great prompt. So if you'd like one of these, please let me know. But it's very important for us, in step number one, to pray for those individuals and consider those people that are in your social sphere that you may be able to influence with the gospel. Now, let's go on to Jesus, the master evangelist. Please turn over to the book of John. Book of John and chapter four. We're going to see Jesus at the at the well with a, a woman, and he is going to, in a, a very amazing way, bring her from just having a, a conversation about a, a cup of water, a drink, going all the way over to revealing that he is the Savior. And so the way that he brings her in that conversation is very important for us to look at. So let us begin in chapter 4. I'll read the first couple of, of verses. Let's begin in verse 3. He left Judea and departed again into Galilee, and he must needs go through Samaria. Now, a little bit of background on here. I know that you are all, all are, are good Bible students, and you know that that phrase, through Samaria, is very unique because Jews did not go through Samaria. Jews went all the way around Samaria. Now, what is the, the quickest way between two points? Is a straight line. And so the straight line from Jew, from Judea all the way up to Galilee, it goes through Samaria. But the Jews despise the Samaritans so much that they will go all the way around the Jordan and up to Galilee just to go around the Samaritans. And that goes all the way back to the captivity. So the Assyrians were very smart. They would carry away a number of the people from the land that they conquered, and then they would bring the Assyrians in to intermix with them, to marry, and it would help keep insurrection down. Now, they had intermarried with the Jews, and so the Jews believed that they were dogs. They were just useless. And so for Jesus to go through Samaria, Jesus was going to break a cultural norm. But Christ did not let culture stop him from presenting the gospel. And culture should never present, prevent us from sharing the gospel either. And when we think about our lives, there's a number of different cultures that we are a part of. One of those cultures is our work culture. It may be that, well, no one speaks about religion at, at work. But something that people always love to talk about at work is problems. People like talking about problems in lunch and during the breaks. 
And that is a perfect opportunity for a child of God to maybe bring in that conversation about Christ, break a cultural norm, break a norm of the, the workplace, and not let that prevent us. But also, let's consider other cultural norms that we might have. It may be that, well, we don't go over to this portion uh, you know, of the city because this portion, there's higher crime. They're not going to be interested in the gospel. It is scary over there. Let's avoid that section of the city or that, that place on the other side of the train tracks. But we have to not let that prevent us. And sometimes we may look at an individual and say, well, that person is living in so much sin that there's no way they would be interested in the gospel. But let's kind of follow out that logic a little bit. If we believe that someone is so in, in, engrossed in sin that they're not going to be interested in the gospel, I think we're giving sin too much credit. Sin is not fun. Sin is distressing. And it may be that those individuals who we just mark off as, well, they're not interested. I know how they live their Friday nights. That might be the person who needs the gospel. Of course, he needs the gospel, but he may be the prime candidate for the gospel. He may be looking for a way out. How do I stop this endless cycle that is causing me so many problems? And so we cannot write anyone off. And that's one of the things I love about Brother T.J. Clark when he teaches our class, and he speaks about the one who brought him to Christ. And he said if you had seen him at one point in his life, no one would have given him the gospel. He would have believed that he was not a prime candidate, and yet he was presented the gospel, and he was converted. So we should never write anyone off as, well, they're not interested, because they may be. But Jesus did not let culture stop him. Let's go read through verse 6, read verses 5 and 6. Then cometh he to a city of Samaria, which is called Sychar, near to the parcel of ground that Jacob gave to his son Joseph. Now Jacob's well was there. Jesus, therefore, being wearied with his journey, sat thus on the well, and it was about the sixth hour. We see that Jesus overcame fatigue to have this conversation with the woman at the well. He was tired. He was traveling for a long distance. His disciples went to go and get food, as we'll see in just a moment. He was tired. And yet he did not let the fatigue prevent him from presenting the gospel. And so let's consider that for our own life. Well, maybe I am tired, maybe I am hungry at a certain moment, but it may be that moment that we have the opportunity to present the gospel to an individual. I know that I've, I've had a number of times where I am waiting at a, a restaurant for a table, and I'm, I'm holding you know, my son Callahan, I, and my wife is there, and other people will, will see us, and they have a, maybe have a baby as well, and they try to strike up a conversation. And for me, at that moment, I'm hungry, I'm tired, I'm not wanting to have a conversation at all, and I don't know how many opportunities I may have passed up just having a conversation with another family, just waiting for a table. You're already going to be there for 30 or 45 minutes, depending upon the, the wait time at that restaurant, but I'm tired. And it may be at those moments that I'm tired, you know, it's at the end of the work day and someone brings me an issue or a problem and I don't want to deal with it, I want to go home. But Christ overcame him being tired and hungry to have this conversation. And it can be very easy for us to kind of withdraw into ourselves and just think about, well, I, I don't want to handle this right now. But we can't let that happen. We have to override how our body is feeling to maybe seize an opportunity that we have. And this is what Christ did in this moment. Now let's, let's read verse 7. There cometh a woman of Samaria to drink water. Jesus saith unto her, Give me to drink. And so he begins this interaction with simply asking her for a favor. And at the very end of this conversation, he is going to reveal himself to be the Messiah, the one that was prophesied of in the Old Testament. And so how is he going to start the conversation with just simply asking a request and then bringing her all the way to the spiritual matter of the salvation of her soul? But this is a, a very important thing for us to consider, is how we steer that conversation to spiritual matters. Because if you evaluate your conversation and my conversation, it is not natural to go from a physical conversation to more spiritual context. Because there's a number of things to talk about physically. You can talk about your family, talk about your job, talk about the weather. And before you know it, the conversation's over. So it takes deliberate practice to be able to steer a conversation from a physical matter, speaking about work, to a more spiritual matter, about someone's soul and about someone's eternal well-being. And that takes a, a lot of, of work. But Christ is going to do this very well. Let's go over to verse 8. For his disciples were gone away unto the city to buy meat. 
And so he chose this, this opportunity at a time when she was alone to be able to speak to her in this way. Now, you can only imagine what his disciples would have said if his disciples were there. Lord, why are you speaking to the Samaritan? We do not speak to the Samaritans. Why are you doing this? And it may have completely destroyed the conversation or the potential of that situation. But he waited for a time when it was just him and the woman at the well to speak to her. And this is a principle that we can take to our own situations with personal evangelism. It may be that there's a situation in the break room and someone is having a difficult situation and you want to speak to them regarding that situation and bring them to maybe a knowledge of the, the Bible or, or just kind of have a deeper conversation. But then there's that other coworker there, the one who always loves to talk, the one who always loves to interject, always loves to overtake the conversation. And maybe you're having that conversation with someone and that person kind of tries to, to include himself or herself into that conversation and it completely destroys where that conversation was going. Sometimes there's opportunities we might have with that individual one-on-one, -on -one, and we can have that serious and deep conversation without fear of distractions, but also it may be that someone may not want to show their ignorance. They might not want to show, you know, a, a head of the household might not want to show, well, I don't know about this area of the, the gospel. They might want to save face in front of their wife, but if you can get that individual one-on-one -on -one and have that conversation, they might be more likely to open up and to be vulnerable. And so that's a principle we must remember for, for our evangelism as well, is that waiting for that time where we can have that one-on-one -on -one conversation with them and be vulnerable and open and bring them to the knowledge of the gospel. Next, let's read verse number nine. Then saith the woman of Samaria unto him, how is it that thou being a Jew askest drink of me, which am a woman of Samaria? For the Jews have no dealings with Samaritans. And so, Jesus was not put off by a potentially offensive statement. This woman comes off initially as very aggressive. Why are you speaking to me? She didn't say, well, yes, let me give you this, this cup of water. She wasn't even necessarily pleasant. But Jesus did not let this deter him. And there's a, a story. I, I was teaching this class at another congregation. And there was a, a man there who is uh, older. He is a, a widow or a widower. And uh, he told me about his conversion story. And how it happened is that he used to work with a number of members of the church. And they were constantly speaking to him, trying to get a Bible study and building up that relationship with him. And he delighted in not only teasing them, but being harsh to them and speaking poorly about the Church of Christ and about them. Day after day, they kept after him. And he constantly threw it back in their face just to annoy them. He said that he got, you know, he, he loved it. It was something he looked forward to at work every single day for three years. Then his wife passed away. And the denomination that he was attending did nothing for him. No prayers, no food, but guess who was there? Members of the church. They did not let those potentially offensive statements deter them. They kept after him. And after his wife passed away, that relationship was developed, he had that Bible study, and he was brought to the Lord's church. Isn't that an amazing story? We cannot let people um, you know, tease us to the point where we say, well, I'm not, not ever going to have a conversation with that individual again. Keep after them and keep praying that there may be an opportunity that arises because that individual, if those members of the church were deterred from his harsh joking, he may never have been converted. And so let's, let us remember that. So Christ did not let these potentially offensive statements put him off. Let's also read verse 10. Jesus answered and said unto her, If thou knewest the gift of God, and who it is that saith to thee, Give me to drink, thou wouldest have asked of him, and he would have given thee living water. Jesus was offering her more than she had. He was offering her this living water. And as humans, it is very hard for us to refuse a gift. And when we, when we receive a, a gift or something from another individual, it makes us naturally want to reciprocate. It reminds me that there's a, a study that was done over trying to get people to respond to surveys. And so there's a number of psychological experiments that can only be conducted by having people kind of fill out surveys. But an interesting thing is, is that there's only a very small portion of the world who actually take the time to fill out the surveys. And so they wanted to see 
what could we do to increase the likelihood that someone fills out these surveys and actually turns them back into us? And so what they did was they would put either a penny, a dime, or a nickel in the envelope with the survey. And there was a significant increase in the responses to the survey just with putting a little bit of money in there. I mean, that's an insignificant amount. You can't even buy anything with that. But they felt obligated to, in turn, fill out that survey. There's a strong need in humans to be able to reciprocate, to give back. And so when you and I have the opportunity to help someone else, it is important for us to try and seize that opportunity and at least offer to have that Bible study with them. Because if we never, if we never ask them if they would like to have that study, we're just leaving that opportunity on the table. They already feel an obligation. Well, yes, I would like to. And then we can step in with that, that opportunity for the Bible study or to have that meal and build that relationship. And then it may progress to where they become saved. They might be more likely to listen. And so we cannot let that pass us by. It's very important for that. Next, let's read for through verse 12, verses 11 and 12. The woman saith unto him, Sir, thou hast nothing to draw with, and the well is deep. From whence then hast thou that living water? Art thou greater than our, our father Jacob, which gave us the well, and drank thereof himself, and his children, and his cattle? Let's continue on down. Jesus answered and said unto her, Whosoever drinketh of this water shall thirst again. But whosoever drinketh of the water that I shall give him shall never thirst. But the water that I shall give him shall be in, a, in him a well of water springing up into eternal life. And so again, this, at this point, Christ is trying to change the conversation to be more spiritual, to speak about this living water. And she goes immediately back to the physical. She thinks, okay, He's talking about a water where I never have to, to draw from this well again. She's still thinking in a physical terms. And this is, of course, very common <laughs> for all of those who are surrounding Christ. Even his disciples continue to not get the point that Christ was speaking about a spiritual kingdom, not a physical kingdom. And this is the same uh, with this woman at the well. She's constantly going back to the physical. And so Christ has to be deliberate and tell her exactly what this water is. And so what we're going to have to do in our conversation is build a door. Again, it's not naturally going to occur that it's going to tend towards spiritual matters, but rather we have to bring that up. Let's continue on through verse 18. Jesus saith unto her, Go, call thy husband, and come hither. The woman answered and said, I have no husband. Jesus saith, uh, said unto her, Thou hast well said, I have no husband, for thou hast had five husbands, and he whom thou, hast, whom thou now hast is not thy husband, and that saith thou truly. And so Christ did not shy away from potential sins in an individual's life. If we are having that, that conversation and, and bringing them to the knowledge of, of the gospel and we're having that Bible study, it may be that we're thinking, ah, oh, this Bible study is going so great. They're listening, they're learning, they're growing. I really don't want to ask them about their marriage. I really don't want to know more about their background. Maybe I could just let that slide. You know, they're, they're, they'll obey the gospel, and then we can kind of get into that later. But that's not the case. In order for someone to be brought to Christ, they must repent. It's a change of mind leading to a change of life. And Christ did not shy away from bringing out this, the woman's sin. And we cannot overlook sin in an individual's life either. Because if someone will not shed that sin in their life, then they are not able to, to come before God with a good conscience, to repent, and to be able to be baptized. And this may, I've seen it in numerous cases with those who are in college. Maybe they have a, a live-in uh, you know, girlfriend or boyfriend, and they're going to have to show that repentance. They're going to have to put away that individual before we can progress with the Bible study. And it may be you know, that we don't want to have that conversation, but Christ did not shy away from that conversation, and neither should we. Let's read through uh, verse 24. The woman saith unto him, Sir, I perceive that thou art a prophet. Verse 19, 20. Our fathers worshipped in this mountain, and ye say that in Jerusalem is the place where men ought to worship. Jesus saith unto her, Woman, believe me, the hour cometh when ye shall neither in this mountain nor yet at Jerusalem worship the Father. Ye worship, ye know not what. We know what we worship, for salvation is of the Jews. 
But the hour cometh, and now is, when the true worshipers shall worship the Father in spirit and in truth. For the Father seeketh such to worship him. God is a spirit, and they that worship him must worship him in spirit and in truth. And so he is speaking to this woman and emphasizing sincerity and truth in worship. Now, of course, those who were in Samaria were worshiping at a Gerizim, which is not the proper location for worship. But let's bring that into a modern day application. If we are studying with someone of a denomination, they may be used to only having the Lord's Supper once a month, once a quarter, whatever the case may be. But we need to emphasize the distinct nature of the Lord's church. We are not some denomination. We do not have arbitrary ways of handling worship. We worship in spirit and in truth with the right attitude and everything is according to the scriptures. That is why we partake of the Lord's Supper weekly. That is why we sing without musical instruments. That is why we do all the things that we do. We do them the way that God prescribed them. And that is the distinct nature of the Lord's church. And so that should be a part of that Bible study, ensuring that people know why we do what we do. It's not just to be different. It is because God commanded it. And so we must emphasize that just as Christ did. Let's read verse 26, 25 and 26. The woman saith unto him, I know that Messiah cometh, which is called Christ. When he is come, he will tell us all things. Jesus saith unto her, I that speak unto thee am he. He identifies himself as the Savior. And this is the point of any conversation or Bible study that we have with an individual is to bring them to Christ. Christ is the point of, and he is who we bring in those conversations. We are not drawing someone to ourself. We're not drawing someone to the local congregation's um, you know, youth events. We're drawing someone to Christ, to the cross, to his sacrifice. And so we must remember that he is the point. Because if we can build that proper foundation and they are brought to someone because of what Christ did for them, because he died for them on the cross, and if we build on that foundation, then that individual will be able to remain strong or more likely to remain faithful. Because if we build their faith on, oh, I love the local congregation, oh, I love the local preacher, oh, I love those youth events that they have, then once those things go, the preacher moves on, those youth events cease, what happens to that individual's faith? It's gone. If you build it upon Christ, it never goes, because Christ never goes. He will always be with us. He will always be there to remind us. So we must remember that we are bringing people to Christ. And even Paul would say in 1 Corinthians 2 and verse 2, For I determine not to know anything among you save Jesus Christ and Him crucified. And that should be our, our mindset as well. Let's read through verse 29. And, came, and, and upon this came his disciples and marveled that he talked with the woman. Yet no man said, What seekest thou, or why talkest thou with her? So they weren't saying anything. But the woman then left her water pot and went her way into the city and saith to the men, Come, see a man which told me all things that ever I did. Is not this the Christ? In order for us to reverse this trend in America, it's going to start with one soul. And I heard a, kind of a, an illustration. I think it's very, very good. If you look at an apple and you cut it in half and you dig out every single seed, you can count the number of seeds that that apple has. But if you look at one single apple seed, there is no telling how many apples will be produced in that seed's lifetime as a tree. Same thing with one soul that you or I convert. There's no telling the far-reaching consequences of that person and how many people that individual will bring to Christ. I know that it's the case uh, for me that my, my great-grandmother was the first person to be converted in my family. And it happened at a grocery store. It happened at a grocery store with a, a woman who was a member of the Lord's Church. Their, their baskets bumped together. They apologized. They struck up a conversation. She came to church that Sunday. They began a Bible study. She was converted. About 20 or 30 years later, uh, my great-grandfather was converted. He was very stubborn and obstinate and, and didn't want anything about it. But then look at the generations. Grandfather, great-grandfather, grandson. The generations of faithfulness from one woman, one soul was converted, and entire families have remained faithful. We don't know the power of just one individual, one soul, that one coworker that you have a, a relationship with that you can capitalize on and have that Bible study with may convert their entire family, 
They may have children who are faithful, and those people may convert more, and that is how you reverse the trend in America. It starts with one soul. And if we can convert one person, there's no telling the far-reaching consequences of that and the joy that will bring to families and to generations. It's a beautiful thing. And so Jesus focused on one contact. We don't have to worry about converting an entire community. Think about that one soul that you have that relationship with. Now let's read uh, verses through verses 30 through 34. Then they went out of the city and came unto him. In the meanwhile, his disciples pray, uh, prayed him, saying, Master, eat. But he said unto them, I have meat to eat that ye know not of. Therefore said the disciples, Ought to another, hath any man brought him ought to eat? You know, is there, maybe he's eaten something that we don't know about. Jesus saith unto them, verse 34, My meat is to do the will of him that sent me and to finish his work. You see that Christ made a sacrifice to have this conversation. He was not focusing upon the meal that he would have that would give him the energy to you know, continue on and to feel better. He was focusing upon that soul that he was talking to. And that was more important for him than even food. And if you and I are going to evangelize, it is going to be at a loss for ourselves. It may be that, okay, well, Friday nights are the nights where I get to relax from work and I get to order a pizza and just watch TV and not do anything. Maybe that that Friday night, you need to give up you know, that, that you know, fun time for yourself and maybe invite that family that you've been talking to over for a meal and build that relationship and have that Bible study, but it's going to come at a loss. You just gave up your Friday night that you could have had just with yourself and just being able to have some time to re recuperate, but rather you're focusing on evangelism. Or at the very least, if you know that you need to uh, kind of work on your knowledge of evangelism and those tools that you can use to convert someone or bring someone to Christ, you may have to give up an evening. You may have to give up a, an evening where you may be doing something that's more preferred to study and to have that conversation. It's going to come at a loss, but are you, am I, willing to suffer that loss? Am I willing to give up that evening to work on evangelism, to have that Bible study, to make that time in my life? Because if I don't make the time, this will never happen. And it's going to take a deliberate effort. So it's something that we have to ask ourselves. But it's also an opportunity. It's an opportunity for all of us to get involved, for us to involve our families. This process of learning how to share the gospel is something that we can also do along with our, our, our children and uh, our grandparents or our you know, grandkids, whomever. Invite them over. Make this a family affair. Let's all grow in this area. It doesn't have to just be an individual opportunity. And even bring your friends. It's a great opportunity. Now, Jesus believed there was always souls ready to harvest. Look at what he says in verse 35. See not ye, there are yet four months, and then cometh harvest. Behold, I say unto you, lift up your eyes and look on the fields, for they are white already to harvest. And so Christ says, open your eyes. He does not say, think of a far distant land where people do not have enough food to eat, that people do not have the gospel, and then let's send people over there. He says, lift up your eyes, look around. They're right here. The souls that we have, we do not have to look over in distant lands like Africa. There's people lost in our community. There's people lost in Memphis. There's people lost in Olive Branch. There's people lost in, our, in where our, our jobs are. In every aspect of our lives, there are people that we come in contact with that are lost. We need to lift up our eyes and see it for what it is. Now, not discounting, of course, overseas mission work. That is very important. We need to focus on that as well. But are we lifting up our eyes to see the opportunity of those souls that are around us? Because it is very important to focus upon them as well. Now let's read verse 36. And he that reapeth receives wages, and gathereth fruit unto, eternal, unto life eternal, that both he that soweth and he that reapeth may rejoice together. Christ is saying there is joy in this opportunity to save souls. And I would ask you, are you happy in your Christian life? Are you happy in your walk with God? Or are you kind of just going through the motions? Because every, every person I've talked to who makes evangelism a priority and they convert just one soul, the amount of joy that that person has is immeasurable. It renews our love and our joy for the gospel as well. Because we may become so accustomed to the gospel and we may take it just kind of for granted. Well, I've always lived this way, I've always known it. But to see someone who does not know the gospel 
who comes to the knowledge of the gospel, who then has their life transformed and they have hope and they have, they have joy in their life, that brings us joy and happiness. And if we just, if we don't evangelize, if we don't bring the gospel to that soul, if we don't make that a priority, we're leaving so much happiness and joy on the table that's just waiting to be taken by us, that's going to help us in our faithful walk with God, helps us to encourage us to keep on going by seeing the joy of the gospel in another's life. And so Jesus saw joy in the future of both the soul winner and also the soul that is won. Let's read verses 37 through 38. And herein is that saying true, one soweth and another reapeth. I sent you to reap that whereon ye bestowed no labor. Other men labored, and ye have entered into their labors. So Jesus recognized that some conversions require time and also more than one, oppor- um, more than one teacher. And so it may not be the case that when you present the gospel to an individual or when you offer that Bible study to someone, they may flat outright reject you. But it may be the case that you've planted a seed in that person's mind. So let's say you knock on someone's door and they, you know, just flat out refuse. You know, I don't want uh, a Bible study. I don't really want to talk to you. But they remember there was a person from that, that Church of Christ down the road who came and knocked on my door. And maybe that sticks in their mind. And then five or ten years down the the line, that individual may be going through a crisis situation. Another member of the Lord's Church comes and knocks on their door. And they remember, I remember five years ago when that other person came. You know what? I'm going to accept this Bible study. That person originally planted the seed. They did not reap. But that other individual who knocked on that door reaped the reward that was planted five years earlier. But if that person five years early had not gone, if they were so worried about rejection that they did not knock on that door, that seed may never have been planted. And so just because you are rejected does not mean that that was an unfruitful interaction. It may come, come to fruition later on down the line. Let's also read verses 39 through 41. And many of the Samaritans of that city believed on him for the, the saying of the woman, which testified, he told me all that ever I did. So when the Samaritans were come unto him, they besought him that he would tarry with them, and he abode there two days, and many more believed because of his own word. And said unto the woman, Now we believe, not because of thy saying, for we have heard him ourselves, and know that this is indeed the Christ, the Savior of the world. And so we can see that Jesus rearranged his schedule because after this happened, he was going to stay there another two days, as it says in verse 43. And so he reversed his plans. Although he was going through Samaria, he stayed there a number of days in order to present the gospel. And you and I have to look at our plans, because it may take a rearranging of our plans to have the opportunity to present the gospel. But we can also think about our plans as a congregation. Uh, it was on it was yesterday, we had the Lego Day at the congregation, and there was a number of kids that were there. There was a very... I mean, it's was, it was quite a large number of kids that were there, but that was an opportunity to be able to go into the community and say, hey, you know, are your children doing anything Saturday afternoon? Would you like to come and you know, we can play with Legos with the other children, kind of have a snack, have an opportunity for, for fellowship? And that may open up the door to have that conversation with that, that parent because they're there watching over their child as they're playing with Legos. The other parents are there as well. Have that conversation. And so those plans are not just for members of the church to enjoy, but also opportunities to reach out to the community, to those who may say, hey, you know, of course I would do that. I'd love for my my children to have that interaction, and I'd like to be there. And then lastly, Jesus knew that one person cannot reach all types of people, but that a team is more effective. It was not just the woman alone who was able to bring them to Christ. She initially went and gathered them, And then once they had heard for themselves, then they believed. It may be the case that we may have to bring them to another person. Another person may be more likely uh, to to reach that individual. Now, I am not from the South. I am more kind of from the North and then the West. And now people who are more ingrained in the South are much more likely to listen to people from the South. And so it may be the case that, okay, I have this very good prospect that I've been talking to, but I know I'm not the person to present the gospel, but I know... This person over here, I know that Evan would definitely click with this person. I'm going to put them in touch with Evan because I know that he's going to be able to bring them to the gospel. Or I know that Brother Cain is going to be able to bring them to the gospel because they're better than I am. 
but it takes a team, and we have a team here at Forest Hill. And so let's be sure that we are using all of the resources that we have to be able to go and seek and to save the lost. And so I, I hope that this has 